Okay, all right, it's February the 6th, 2010. I'm just taking us back to 2006 on the 15th of September, just before we were going to leave Suffolk and come back to Somerset. Um, I went off to a couple of little villages to do some last minute recording, and they were quite valuable as well. So here we go, this is Sheila, and in a minute we'll be visiting Wickham Brook, um, where Isaacsons used to hang out and um, other families, the Peshes, and um, then we go on to Depton. So here we go. Right, it's the 15th of September 2006, it's a Friday, and I'm just quickly going to say that a lot has happened since I came back from London on my trip there, and we're actually moving from Suffolk back to Somerset. I should provide more details later. Right, I'm out on my travels. I'm trying to fit a few things in. We haven't got much time left now. Um, on um, the 21st, we're moving back to Somerset. Well, I'm taking the stuff down then. Then on the Saturday, the 30th, me and Zara, Brandy and Louis will be travelling down. We've had to go back for financial reasons, but I intend to come up here on pilgrimages and holidays to carry on the research. We were hoping to stay another six months, but we just haven't been able to really, and not only that, we do miss the rest of the family and the, my grandchildren. Um, but I have done an awful lot of work here. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I didn't really want to go yet. Like I said, I wanted to spend the winter in, in the archives. Uh, I've done quite a lot of field work, and I'm trying to fit a few churches in while I can the time I've got left. Um, anyway, I'm at Wickhambrook where Isaacson's <coughs> are known to have lived. I found a church. We came here the other day, me, Zara, Brandy, but we couldn't find it, but I've managed to find it now. So I'm going to have a little scan. The church is called All Saints. Wickhambrook All Saints. Oh, the church is actually open. Um, had been said that it's really open, but I found it open. So that's good. I'm just going to have a quick scan. I haven't got a lot of tape. I've only got one side. Freik seems to be quite a common name here. I didn't do a, a, a report inside because of, um, I just had a quiet, it was a bit creepy in that church actually. I don't normally feel that uh, creepy, but um, it was the memory, it was the sound of the clock. John Horton, Prike. Yeah, there's monuments of Prike here. Everywhere. More Prike. Frost. Wing. Isaac Smith. He died 1841, he's 34. More Smith. Peacock. He died in. Born in 1796, died in 1860. Marrow. Some of these are Brewster. Are sort of in the trench, thrown in the church. You know, this is sliding off the banks. I suppose it's better than nothing. Richard Cook. He died in 1880, age 69. And uh, Ephraim Crick. There's some Isaacson's married Crick. He died in 1865, age 30 something. These are massive. It shows that uh, with the stones right out the ground, you can see how big they are. They're as tall as me. Massive things. Quite a big one. To a Robert Rolfe, who died in 1860, age 80 odd. There are a lot of old ones here, but they're not um, easy to read. It's a pretty little village, like fenced cottages. William Rayner, big one to him, he died in 1800, age 78, a big table-like one. Quite a big graveyard, it sprawls out under trees and things. Dawson Hull, Hanbury, and the back of the church. There's um, some plaques in, with, with decoration embedded into the side of the walls. 
Charles Thornton, M.A., born 1801, vicar of this parish, 1829 to 1853, and rector of Hartest, come Boxted. Also Harriet, the wife of Reverend Charles Borton. Because I've got my sandals on, I haven't put my proper shoes on. The few greys are dotted about. Very spongy. A good win. Memory of a Thomas Constable as well. Broken up that one, it's not very easy to see. This is Constable Country as well. Constable One, I'm going to take a picture of this one. It's, um, I think it's Hannah Constable, wife of, could be Thomas. Still hard to read though. The date. Very hard to read. There's funny writing on it. Henry Shave, he died in 1860. And Anne Shea, who died in 1877 age 74. Uh, they've had a good tidy up here, and they've got the place of graves all over the place. I've just come across an Isaacson. In fact, I've just come across a load of Isaacsons. Huge, great big slabs. Isaacson's. Some are back to back. There's a 
I'm really desperate in those days, don't I? But now I, I can just go back and visit when I like. It's it's cool. Back to the cassette. Well, I hope that... Yeah, I found three big graves. Big stones. These people, I mean, they, they might have been... Had a bigger... You know, like a big, bigger piece of uh, memorial. It's just... Um, you know, that, that they've been put in the ground like this. At least I found some. You know, this is the lovely thing when you're doing your own family. Even if these are different cousins, it don't matter. They would come from the same people in, at one point. There will be a common ancestor for these people here. I knew they were here. We came the other day and couldn't find them. And they said, you've got to find us. You've got to come back and find us. And there's just a little stone around the back here. I'm just going to have a look at. It's on its own. And that's a Green, a William Green, who died in 1825, age 84, and 
Looks like he had a wife called Elizabeth. Yeah, behind that laugh, James laugh is a, um, a James Bocock. Behind him. This is under a wooded area. James laugh is actually under a fir tree. Of course, we've, I've discovered links with Wickenbrook, which goes back to the, the Peshes and um, all that line. And, of course, there's also um, Stuttvilles at some point there and other family, Isaacsons, of course. So I've got, I found out an awful lot since um, 2006. Um, and it looks like he had more of a memorial once as well. It's crumbled away. By the tower and right up close is um, a William Death. He died in 1833. That does appear sometimes. Yeah, there's a Joshua Marrow. He died in 1895, age 87. And Louisa Marrow, who died in 1884, age 74. And more Marrows. Some that died in 1821, a John. And an Anne, who died in 1856, age 70. And Alfred Murray, he was not 84 when he died, in 1905. They do live to quite ripe old ages, right? Some of these old graves, so especially the ones with like the little angel figures on the top. You can tell when you see that, that these are old. I mean, there's one here, 1785, of a John, the son of somebody. And then you can't read anymore. Son of Elizabeth, it could be. Somebody. A big monument to Thomas Rayner, who died October the 22nd. Aged 80 in 18... <sighs> the Ivy Looks like 1810, or it could be 18... Yeah, 1810, he died. Age 6, his wife. She died as well in an October, she was 64, and her son, who died aged 34 in a certain time in the 18th century. Yeah, like there's lots of prikes around here as well, a William and a Thomas and a Sophia, lots and lots of prikes. Also a William, Susan, something of William Robinson. Oh, a very old that's cottage backing onto the graveyard near like the little, I suppose it's like a village hall, I'm not sure. A George Carsbolt, that's unusual, he died on March the 17th, 1863, age 76. And another, and Anne Marie, wife of George Carsbolt, she died in 18... Looks like 1810. He's 34. She must have died a lot sooner than him. I'm going to take a picture right up close to this pink cottage, which will incorporate some of the Isaacson graves in the distance behind the tower. Of course, these Isaacsons that we're associated with is we have a great grandmother called Anne Isaacson who married a James Mason in X. Well, no, she didn't marry him in X. She married him in um, Kennet. She was born in Freckenham. I'm still on the trail of James. Um, don't know if I'll ever get round to it now I'm having to move. Cricks are also quite common in here as well. Um, yeah, cricks. So that's why the Isaacsons, from, they were from Burwell, a big family of Isaacsons in Burwell. And Landwade, where they, they were gen gentry and lived in Landwade Hall, um, which was bought by a Stephen Isaacson back in the early 17th century. And we've got Stephen Isaacson, who was a vicar of Feckenham Church. This will be on another tape, this is just a reminder. As I walk back now to the van, <coughs> just me, Rick moaning on a bit for about feeding um, Sam
mad about leaving uh, Suffolk, but I know that I, you know, I'm going to be able to go back there anyway. Um, so it's just me roaming on, <coughs> rambling on, going somewhere else. I probably would have pushed that way, but at the same time, I've missed my my other children. Not that I wanted to stay away forever. I just. Talking about Wick and Brook and Depton, by the way, it's, it, the tape's a bit jumpy because I'm sort of in the van driving around and I'm rambling on. More likely to be great because of the time of their existence. So, and I'm sat here now in my van having a ham roll. The beautiful church, All Saints at Wickham Brook, Wickham Brook, with Isaacsons with lovely big stones under the trees. I've got all these Isaacsons on the 18th century censuses. One of the John C. Isaacsons was born in 1850, I think. They were all farmers. They had like something like 140 acres of land round there. Relatives of theirs were solicitors. In London, who eventually went and lived in Bury St. Edmunds. There's a, an, a vicar at Bradfield Com Combus. He was an Isaacson. Good Stuckville, I think his name was. So they either went into law or they were priests. I want to go back there and have another look at his grave. The pink thatched building which lies sort of within the graveyard area, were actually almshouses. Um, they were built by an Anton Anthony Sparrow um, in the 16th century. It's for the poor of Wickham Brook. Right, it's uh, 20 to 4. I'm very lucky, actually, because a man's just come to lock the church up. So I, I got in just in time to have a look inside. I'll do a small commentary. I'm being followed by, I'm going down a lovely country lane and I'm being followed by a great big red double-decker bus. Who believe it? Of course, the Burwell Isaacsons have all got loads of memorial plaques within Burwell Church, which we did when we came on our holiday, me and Zara, uh, over a year ago now. When we were first inspired to come up here and um, do our family tree work. Right, I'm now going down another country lane to a place called Depton. I don't know how you pronounce it, but Isaacsons were also found in the censuses to be living here. Right, Depton. I've had to park my van up and I've got a three quarter of a mile walk. Apparently you can't drive up this because it narrows. Just going past the place where they keep a lot of tractors. The weather doesn't look brilliant, so I hope I don't get soaked before I get there. Probably. Oh, so they get to it. If you've got to, if they're 
any route to it. It could be that there is a way through somebody's property. So I did notice something saying strictly by appointment. I'm about to leave my van and I'm... It's quite windy, it's not raining yet. And I'm walking out in the middle of nowhere. Hopefully it's safe and I'm going to try and find this church. Maybe it's going to turn out to be a place like Landwade, which is a church within um, some rich person's grounds. There's a lake coming up and it looks like there's grounds here, trees and seats within the woods. Um, reminds me a bit of Landway, so maybe this place is a private church, but you know, sort of public, private. Yes, I'm going on this country path, a lake or a pond, very black, and all around me there's like fields. And I'm wandering around, I've just seen an orange arrow, so obviously this has been done before. I'm now going across a wooden bridge, similar to the ones we had in Barrow. Not the sort of place you normally walk on your own, but uh, us family tree people that are in passion sort of go anywhere. It looks like I might be coming up to me. I can see a signpost. Yeah, I thought I might have done this. It would have been a nice sort of walk for Brandy. I've just got to see, follow the sign to the church. Of course, unbeknown to me, not long after this was taken, um, the Suffolk Strangler, the serial killer, was at loose in Suffolk, around the Ipswich area, mainly after prostitutes. I mean, they caught him, but he, he murdered five or six women that that we know of so there was me crawling around in the middle of nowhere but he was um, a lorry or a van driver anyway back to the cassette it's coming up to a wooden sign now after walking through a small wood and the sign says public footpath one way public footpath there's no sign to the church, so I, I assume I carry on. Um, I'm just going to quickly look round this hedge first, just in case I'm going, I don't want to go the wrong way. I think I'll carry on this way, actually, because this is sort of going round the village, around the outside of the park. What I'll do, I'll go up to the next public footpath sign. This is a real mystery. I don't want to be carrying on for miles up where I'm going. The orange arrow disappeared after a while. I can't even see a church, but I could be taking the wrong way. Still, it's part of the adventure. He didn't tell me that there would be a crossroad, did he? But I'm only coming this way because it's sort of surrounding the village. And it could be that it's at the back here somewhere. Some massive big gardens. The other side of a hedge there. Three quarters of a mile, he said. I mean, I could be going the complete wrong way, but if I'd carried on, I think I would have gone further out of my way, but who knows? There's no sign to the church. It's a bit of a, one of these Suffolk mysteries. I'm, I'll go online later and see what the... There's a bloke that's done um, a really big study of Suffolk churches. And, uh, I didn't plan on coming to this one. So it'll be interesting. I still can't see no spire, no tower. Somebody's whacking great garden there. I'm hoping the church will be up here in a minute. Like I said, I'm 
we're out in the middle of nowhere, there's a, a wood back there. But something told me to follow this way. I don't know if that'd be right. Oh, there's more signs now. You see, there's a maze of footpaths. You could end up going anywhere. Let me just see what this one says. No mention of a church, you see. And that's another sign up here. He should have said to me, bare left. I can't see a church anywhere. I'm wandering about. Not really knowing where the church is. He said three quarters of a mile. See it being a church over there. It's a bit of a mystery, I can't find it. There's no one to ask. I'm gonna follow round this path. There's a path that goes through a dark wood. Um, I'll go and have a look up here. This is taking me on like a circular walk. I come this way. I might be able to see something when I get up here, maybe. I can hear the busy road, so I'm probably going the wrong way. In which case, I'm not going to be walking three quarters of a mile. I'm going to be walking five miles to try and find this church. I'm right in the middle of nowhere, in a wood. Maybe I should have carried on, but there was no sign. And there's nobody to ask. There's a building up here. I'm sure this comes back onto that road. There might be someone in the garden. I could shout out to him. Somebody digging their lawn. And it, this looks a bit too... Remote. Somebody's gone to find out for me because it looks like it's a bit of a wild goose chase. He's just gone to go and ask somebody, they might not know either. Right, I just met a very helpful gentleman who told me that. The local farmer has fallen out with the church, so he doesn't allow people to use his fields or driveway for access to Dipton Church. Um, I have got a backtrack a bit, it won't be far, as long as it don't pour with rain. And um, I should have gone straight across at the first crossroad, so it can't be far now. But apparently when they have funerals and everything, they have to carry the coffins. Or they, I don't, you know, because it's only a narrow track, um, they have, and it's quite a while away. Um, and if they've got to do any work in the churchyard or anything, it's all, you know, they're not allowed to touch the fields. Anyway, I'm back out in the open now. I was fortunate seeing somebody. I'm going to go back to the original crossroad now. It makes it more interesting, this particular little field trip, um, because someone was looking to buy a property and he didn't know, the first man I spoke to, he, he didn't know where he was, so he went and found somebody, and uh, it's a little bit of local history for him if he's going to buy this place, so anyway, it's taken me longer than I thought, he should have said carry straight on when you get to the thing, um, I'm going to stop now because I'm nearly out of tape. Right, I've got here, I've not got a lot of tape, so I'm going to do a scan. And I'll only come on tape if I find anybody. There is a fire, a pledger, a Clifford. This place is right in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I would love this one. There's a couple of big vaults here. There's a one with a great big tree coming out of it. Another great big upright slab of a Lloyd family, a Mary Ann. 
Lloyd. Just hold the boy, Dixon. A pink marble to the dear memory of a beloved husband of a father, Sidney Fuller Isaacson, who passed onward the 12th of May 1946 with a pink marble surround, an upright pink marble cross under a tree. So there was one here, I found him. This is a really creepy graveyard by the way, it's surrounded by woods, very overgrown, and all sorts of monuments emerging from the undergrowth. That was a relatively new grave, I think, marble one. People called Steel, Reed, there's a green. There's three chalice graves in a row. Louisa Mary Ann Death, died in 1913, age 85. Barber, a ginger. Palmer, a Crick, a Leonard Crick, who died in 1927, age 61, and Celia Ann Crick, who died in 1934. And you've got um, a Maud Victoria, wife of H.W. Reeve. She was 37 when she died in 1924. This is St. Mary's Church at Depton. Big padlock on it, can't get in. Have a look through the window. I'm just going to go back and take It's very creepy here. There's lots of weird noises. I'll go back there. It's like a horror film, really. That was a very, very creepy graveyard. I don't think I'd want to... I didn't feel comfortable in there. How, how remote it was. I keep looking back, it's like I'm walking past a wood and now a dark lake. Um, going across a bridge. Yeah, that was very creepy, but I did find an Isaacson, so I've got a name there to work on. <sighs> Sydney. Oh, I'm out in the light a bit now. That was very creepy, that was. You almost feel as if they're going to follow you. Oh, that was scary. Yeah, it was extremely creepy that was because I was right, very, very isolated. You know, um, I know you, people say you've got to be scared of the living more than the dead, but you felt as if they were watching you. It was, it was very overgrown, lots of rusty old railings and big old coffin type tombs. I'm looking back as I walk. And it's a, oh, I'm walking back through a bit of a wood, but there is um, somewhere at the other side. They have got arrows leading there, but when you came to the crossroad, the arrows disappeared. And it seems like you've got the old fire burning. There's piles of wood where someone's obviously, somebody works around there gathering in piles of wood, but, you know, it's like, it's like a bit like the hills of ice, you know, it was, um, feeling like that, and I thought, best to go now, you've had a quick look round, the church was shut, and I'm going to go to Teevington now, I might have enough petrol, you know, it's like when you watch these horror films, you always think, well, why did they go down that lane? Why did they isolate themselves? I mean, I was crawling around gravestones under dark trees, under undergrowth. Um, I found myself in that position. It's weird. But that's what you say, you know, why... You know, they always say, let's go down here when you, everybody knows they shouldn't. So that was creepy. That must be the creepiest one I've been to, mainly because it was isolated. Lots of unreadable stones, lots of hidden stones. So I said there were more Isaacsons in there. Finally, there's one family outstanding this way, and that's the Masons. Right, 
just been talking to a chap who's got a bungalow just by the footpath before you go up to the church. He gave me a little bit of a rundown. I think his family, his mother, who's 90, has lived here for years. And he said the big landowners around here was somebody called Rolf. Um, and, you know, he, he was quite interesting to chat to, really. It's all part of the story to tell my grandchildren one day. Right, yeah, I think I do do um, a tape recording of the Stanton Church, the derelict one, because it, the architectural features are stunning, and I've got lots of pictures I took of that church. As it was amazingly beautiful, really, um, and, and it had a big graveyard as well. I, I also took pictures of the red grave one, but I must have run out of tape then. I was cramming all these churches into, like, a couple of days, a week before we were due to leave, everything was coming, throwing itself at me, and I, that's why I didn't want to leave at the time, because there was too much to do, and there still is, so, but anyway, I'm not quite so distressed, I can go back, if, even if it's only every couple of years, I mean, I am still thinking in the future of maybe of going up there for another six months, actually, but not for a couple of years yet, I might wait until I'm retire actually go up there for you know for a while and then eventually I should come back here um right so that's all I can say at the moment yeah I've been to creepy Depton and it was creepy there 
and like I said, there there was a serial killer on the loose. Um, weeks within us, us leaving Suffolk, um, this man murdered several women um, and dragged them into woods and dumped them. You know, so... Um, anyway, over and out for now, folks.